Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's pet podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Roberta Westbrook, and you're here with us at the Campus for All Animals, the Houston SPCA. We're so happy to have you with us each week so we can give you a little bit of information about how to keep your pets healthy and happy for the, their lifetime. So while we think about today's topic, which is going to be all about nervous system diseases. So if you have any questions, about how you know whether or not your pet has a nervous system disease, what is the nervous system, what things should you know about it, please type those things into the chat and hopefully I can help give you some answers today. In the meantime, I want to introduce you to our pet of the week. Our pet of the week is Vince. Vince came to us from way down in Galveston and Vince is looking for a new home and he is so sweet, loves butt scratches. And so if you have a you know, tendency to want to pet dogs and you love to scratch their butts, then this is the dog for you. So please come on down and visit him and all the animals that we have available for adoption in our adoption center. We're open every day from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, so please come on down. Vince is doing so well, loves people, would make a great, great family pet. So. We are going to talk about the nervous system today. And, you know, this is very interesting because a lot of people don't realize that many of the diseases that people get, there's some similar version or sometimes the exact same disease that animals can get. And so just like people have a nervous system, the system um, that helps us to move and be coordinated, and it includes our brain and our spinal cord and our nerves that go throughout the body, animals have the same nervous system, which means that they get very similar or sometimes the same diseases that people get that affect the nervous system. And we're gonna talk about some of those and how you may be able to recognize those in your pet and when you should see your family veterinarian. So again, the nervous system and diseases that affect the nervous system. Let's just start with basic anatomy. Like I mentioned, the main parts of the nervous system, especially the central nervous system, are your pet's brain and your pet's spinal cord. Now, off of your pet's spinal cord that goes through the vertebral column, the spine, there are lots of what we call peripheral nerves or nerves that branch off of the spine, off of the spinal column and travel all throughout the body. And they help all of the muscles and the tissues and the organs to function normally. So that is in very basic terms, uh, the nervous system and the parts of the nervous system. But unfortunately, sometimes pets can succumb to injury or disease of the nervous system. Uh, so we'll talk about some of those uh, now. We had a recent case here um, of a, a cute little dog that was brought in through our ambulance team that had sustained some head trauma. Uh, we think from you know being hit by a car, that is one way that we commonly see animals get damage to the nervous system. So sometimes when animals get trauma, like hit by a car, they may sustain head injuries, and head injuries mean that the brain can swell. Well, when the brain swells inside of the skull, the skull is like a hard, bony casing, and it doesn't give. There's nowhere for that brain tissue to go. So now when the brain is swelling inside of the skull, it can cause some pretty serious uh, symptoms that we see outside. And those symptoms that we might see are dullness, seizures, coma-like activity, difficulty walking, sometimes blindness, uh, because all of the nerves in the brain are also being damaged from the swelling. And so these are some of the things that we see in head trauma. If, if your pet sustains any type of head trauma, uh, please have them see your vet family veterinarian right away. This is an emergency. It could be life-threatening, but oftentimes if it's treated quickly with time, we can get those pets back to near normal, if not normal. So trauma is a common thing that we see here. Uh, we have a wonderful 24-hour ambulance where our emergency team goes out and rescues animals that sustain injury. Um, and that's one of the injuries that we see commonly that affects the nervous system. So what questions do you have about nervous system diseases? So are there some of them are they're born with this disease or do some of them progress with life? Yes, that's a great question. Sometimes animals can be born with central nervous system diseases and it could be caused sometimes by infection that happens when they're actually in the womb. Um, and sometimes it's caused by just malformations that occur when there are uh, mutations that occur during development. You know, one of the 
things that pets can be born with occurs in cats and kittens. So sometimes there are kittens that are born that are really unstable. They seem uncoordinated, they're unstable. They, we call it ataxic, where they're very wobbly and unstable when they walk. Um, and sometimes this can be caused by an infection that the mother obtained while she was pregnant. And when they have this infection, the infection is called panleukopenia. When they have this infection, then it can affect the development of a portion of the brain responsible for coordination. And that part of the brain is called the cerebellum. Well, when kittens are born, when they've had this infection in utero, um, unfortunately, sometimes they're born without that coordination because their cerebellum uh, is not formed correctly. And so they're just very uncoordinated. Many of these cats can go on to live happy, healthy lives, but they're essentially born with this malformation of their brain. So yes, they can certainly be born with some of these conditions. And sometimes there's conditions that happen as animals age. So is that the same thing as wobbler syndrome um, or is that something different? Oh yes. So if you've heard of a condition called wobblers or wobblers syndrome, you know, sometimes people might use these terms and mean two different diseases, but certainly if you see a, a kitten that's uncoordinated, <laughs> you might call it a wobbly kitty. Yeah. That is a different disease and cerebellar hypoplasia that I just talked about. That's a different disease than what we call wobblers syndrome that tends to occur commonly in Doberman pinchers. So Doberman pinchers are a breed that gets a condition called wobbler syndrome. And what happens, it can happen in Great Danes too and other large breeds, uh, but Doberman pinchers and Great Danes tend to have it um, more commonly. Uh, what it is, is uh, it's compression of the cervical vertebrae, the, the vertebrae in the neck. This, the, this area of the spinal column. Sometimes the vertebrae become compressed and unstable and it pinches on the spinal cord in that area. And what we see when this happens is we can see these dogs have difficulty walking, particularly in the rear limb. Their rear limbs may be unstable. They may drag their paws in the rear limb. Um, and sometimes this progresses and it can even affect their, their forelimbs. Um, but this is wobbler syndrome. It is usually treated with surgery. So if you notice an abnormal gait or the way that your Doberman pincher or large breed dog is, is walking, um, sometimes that can be because there's been some sort of instability of the vertebrae in the neck and they can certainly have abnormal gait in either the rear limbs or all four limbs in some cases. And then our my uh, dog ended up getting with an ear infection. He's not acting the best afterwards. Could that be a sign of a neurological d disorder? Will it go away? Oh, yes. So you mentioned that your dog had an ear infection and that maybe that could have caused a nervous system injury. And sometimes that can happen. So uh, chronic ear infections, can definitely get so bad that they move deep, deep, deep into the ear, into what we call the inner ear. And in those cases, it can actually affect uh, cranial nerve eight. Uh, cranial nerve eight is the vestibular nerve. It's the nerve that, again, is responsible for hearing and, and balance of the head. And so chronic ear infections can affect the vestibular system and the vestibular nerve. And you might notice that some animals with chronic ear infections could have uh, like a head tilt um, or could become deaf. And that is because of the damage that it, that it has to the vestibular nerve. So absolutely chronic ear infections could affect the central nervous system by affecting the nerves. Um, and then how do we determine whether an older German Shepherd may have arthritis or just a degenerative like a disease? Oh yes. Um, so if you have a, a large breed dog, one of the common things that we've talked about before is the development of arthritis. As dogs get older, particularly large breed dogs, they might develop arthritis in their hips and that can cause an abnormal gait as well. Sometimes the gait is short and choppy and stiff and painful. And those are symptoms of arthritis that can look very similar to nervous system disorders or diseases of the nervous system that cause paralysis or paresis, what we call weakness in the hind limbs. And so you may have your veterinarian do a more thorough exam to determine whether the cause of your dog's signs are based on the musculoskeletal system, like arthritis, or 
whether they're stemming from the nervous system, um, which would be a disease, as you mentioned, degenerative myelopathy, for example. So there are conditions of the spinal cord that get worse over time, and they may start fairly mild, and we may not notice them at the beginning, where uh, large dogs like German shepherds may become weak in the hind limbs. They may become wobbly in their gait in the hind limbs, and they may be in, begin to even sort of what we would say drag the hind limbs, where their paws, the, the back side of their paws, the top of their paws, sort of drag the ground, and they don't pick them up as normally as they used to. Um, this disease can progress and continue to get worse, uh, where the patients can sometimes become completely paralyzed. Um, it's, a, again, a nervous system disease. It affects the, the spinal column, um, and dogs that have degenerative myelopathy continue to get worse. Uh, and there's no cure for degenerative myelopathy, but there certainly are some treatments to help keep your pet more comfortable. You should see your family veterinarian if you're seeing any of the signs that I've mentioned where your pet may have difficulty walking. And are they, um, on the other side of the size spectrum, are there any diseases that affect the smaller breeds or the shorter ones? Yes, great question. So what sorts of um, you know, nervous system diseases may affect small breed dogs? And probably overwhelmingly, the most common one that we see in small animal medicine is called intervertebral disc disease, intervertebral disc disease, or IV. DD, intervertebral disc disease, uh, is most common in dachshunds. So we see it very commonly in dachshunds, but can happen really in any breed of dog that tends to have short legs relative to the length of the body, shorter legs relative to the length of the body. So basset hounds and dachshunds, and sometimes even shisus or uh, lots of opsos, you might notice that that disease happens in them too. What happens is in the spinal column between each bony vertebrae, the bones of the, of the spine, there is a cartilage disc that goes between each bone of the spinal column. Well, sometimes during heavy play or injury, what happens is that cartilage disc becomes extruded or it moves out of its original place. Well, the place that it typically moves to is to pinch on the spinal cord, which usually lives right above it. And so the disc will move out of place, pinch on the spinal, on the spinal column, and cause paralysis or weakness. And it can be very, very painful. So uh, this, is, again, is a common thing that we see in dachshunds. And so keeping them safe by not, not letting them kind of jump up on their legs because as they jump up on their hind legs, it puts more pressure on the spinal column, um, giving them ramps and stairs to use instead of jumping on and off couches and chairs. Those are ways that you could prevent that disc from uh, popping out of place and pinging on the spinal column. But yes, that's a very common disease that we see in small breed dogs, can be fixed with surgery. Um, and if it's a mild case, can sometimes be managed with medical therapy, with just medication, uh, but oftentimes it's a surgical correction. And if it's treated soon enough, sometimes these dogs can go back to normal. But yes, intervertebral disc disease can be common in smaller breed dogs. And is epilepsy also seen in dogs? And if so, do the seizures look the same or do they sometimes have different types of seizures than humans do? We call um, epilepsy, it's a disease where your pet may have multiple seizures over a period of time without a really cause that we can find out. So epilepsy is really un unclear reasons for seizures. And so if you notice that your pet is having a seizure, it can look very similar to a seizure in a person. So sometimes seizures can be focal and can occur in a part of the body. Sometimes it's a twitch in the face. Sometimes it's a twitch in the paw. Those are focal seizures. But grand mal seizures or seizures that affect the entire body, you might notice that what's happening with your pet is they are falling over on their side. Their full body is tense. Their full body is going through convulsions. Sometimes they hypersalivate, salivate, excuse me. Uh, they chatter their jaw. Um, they may lose control of their urine and their bowels. And so this can be very scary to see. If you've uh, ever seen e even a, a person or a pet have a seizure, it's a very uh, difficult thing to watch. 
Uh, I would encourage you if you are noticing that this is happening in your pet, please see a vet, family veterinarian right away. But if it's happening for the first time and you're wondering what to do, try just to keep uh, your pet safe uh, by protecting their head. Uh, what I mean by that is you may want to have some towels or pillows around so that if they're convulsing, that they're not injuring themselves by bumping into things in their environment. So you may want to create space around them uh, or use towels or something soft pillows around them so that if they do uh, go through a lot of convulsions that they're not injuring themselves. You should also keep yourself safe. Don't put your hands in or around your pet's mouth while they're having a seizure. They could bite you accidentally. Um, but epilepsy can be treated. So please see your family veterinarian. They may not treat your family pet if your pet has only had maybe one or two seizures in, over a long period of time, over several months or over several years. But when the seizures become very frequent, usually more than two a month, two or more a month, when they're becoming very frequent, your veterinarian may opt to do some treatment and put your pet on some medications to prevent that from happening again. But epilepsy can happen both in people and animals. Um, and is it possible for pets to contract an, a neural disorder from an external source? Oh, yes. So sometimes they can get nervous system disorders from other things. There's diseases that they can get from ticks. For example, there's something called tick paralysis, where uh, certain species of ticks called dermacenter ticks can actually carry a neurotoxin. And so a neurotoxin is like a toxin that affects the nervous system and it can cause full body paralysis, even respiratory paralysis in some dogs that get tick paralysis. So tick paralysis. So again, another reason to make sure that you're keeping your pet on tick um, prevention and flea prevention as well. So tick paralysis is something. You can also get uh, nervous system disorders from viruses and bacteria that affect the nervous system. One of the most common things that we see that we vaccinate for though is distemper virus. Distemper virus is one that you may have heard of because you're probably getting your dog vaccinated against distemper virus every year. And distemper virus is one that affects multiple systems. It affects the gastrointestinal system, um, but it all, and the respiratory system, but it also affects the nervous system. And it can cause those focal seizures that I mentioned earlier, where your pet may have twitching of the face or of the jaw or of the paws. So certainly that is one. And then we've all heard of rabies. Rabies is certainly a viral disease that can affect the nervous system um, and is considered fatal. So again, keeping your pet properly vaccinated against these diseases can help to prevent them. And can a dog ever recover from hand, like hind paralysis or is there probably a good outcome with therapy? Yes, great question. So if your dog has a condition or an injury that has resulted in paralysis, meaning they're not able to uh, use their limbs or in some cases not able to feel their limbs, there is treatment available. In some cases, they can become normal again. For example, I mentioned intervertebral disc disease and dachshunds. You know, that disease is very extreme. It happens very suddenly. It's an acute onset of paralysis, but if treated right away, oftentimes with surgery, the pressure on the spinal cord can be relieved. And once the spinal cord reduces in inflammation, usually function can go back to normal. So uh, that's one case where certainly it might be possible for your pet to have full return to function. It doesn't happen in every case. It does depend on the severity and how soon we intervene. So just get with your family veterinarian right away. And in other cases with physical therapy, um, with acupuncture, uh, and with other uh, methodologies to repair the central nervous system and support it, you can get a very good return to function in some of these conditions. So it's, it's possible, it may not be possible in all cases, it depends on the original cause of the injury um, and how long it took for us to intervene. But in some cases, dogs can live long, happy lives, even with some level of neurologic disease. And then on the, you know, complete opposite side of that, if it is a pet that does have a debilitating condition and, you know, there isn't much cure or therapy isn't working, how do we determine your pet's quality, quality of life? That's a great question. You want to make sure that when, when your pet has been diagnosed with a condition that is incurable or that you know is, is going to get worse, it's really important that we're supporting your the pet, making sure uh, that they are having a good quality of life. And this can be a very difficult thing to evaluate. What you wanna do is get with your veterinarian and get with your family and determine uh, what is a good day for your pet. 
you know, as they progress in their disease, you want to have some parameters that show you that they're still able to enjoy life. You know, you want to be able to uh, make sure that they are, are happy and that they are not in pain. And oftentimes your veterinarian can help you with pain management if it's there. Uh, they may be able to show you and fit uh, your pet for a wheelchair. There are wheelchair options. There are slings that you can use that can that you can put around the belly of your pet that can help you um, support your pet as they go on walks with you. So there are ways to help keep your pet's quality of life high um, as they go through the disease process. If, it, if there comes a time where you feel like your pet is in pain um, and they're not enjoying the things that they used to, please talk to your vet family veterinarian um, about when they may uh, help you make options and have choices about what the next steps could be. Well, we thank you for joining us again here at the Houston SPCA and on the Pet Podcast. So I know that was a lot of information for in a short period of time on nervous system diseases. Um, but again, if you ever notice that your pet is, is different and changing, please contact your family veterinarian. Uh, some of these diseases uh, can, can be treated, uh, but there's some diseases that happen normally as your pet ages. So it could be a normal aging change and there are treatments that we can do for those as well. So see your family veterinarian, make sure you're keeping your pets happy and healthy for their entire lives. Now, we want to invite you to come on down to the Houston SPCA's Campus for All Animals for our annual open house. It's happening tomorrow. Tomorrow, April 1st, is our open house. We want to have, welcome you. Bring your family, bring your children, bring your friends. It's going to be a fun time. We are going to have adoption events. We're going to have Easter egg hunts for the children. We're going to have a beer garden for the adults and all kinds of prizes and giveaways. So please make a day of it tomorrow. We're here from 12 to 4 tomorrow for our open house. 12 to 4 is going to be when you can enjoy all these activities. Um, you'll be able to hear demonstrations, see demonstrations, and hear information from the Wildlife Center of Texas and our Equine and Farm Animal Center. You're going to learn so much. It's going to be very interactive. We can't wait to see you tomorrow, 12 to 4, here at the Houston SPCA. Thank you for joining us every week on the Pet Podcast. We'll see you next time.